Hello, Katie Kimball here with the Healthy Parenting Connector, and I am back with part two of a fascinating two-part interview with Dr. Katie of the SOS Approach. We talked about picky eaters and problem feeders, and last week's episode was all about how to figure out what kind of eater you might have. Now, problem feeders are a small percentage, like 5 to 10% of kids who really struggle with learning how to eat, and they really do need feeding therapy, and that was the encouragement at the end of the last episode. Now, in this episode, we're going to jump into picky eaters, which is like a quarter of the kids out there, up to maybe 50% at ages two and three, and some of those outgrow it. Dr. Toomey is going to go into some really practical steps that you parents and me can take at the table and in the kitchen outside of food um, that could help your picky eaters learn to eat better. And it starts with one of the most fascinating, mind-blowing facts that I've heard in a really long time, and it's literally about the chairs your kids are sitting on. Tune into this episode, and oh my goodness, are you ever going to learn something that will help your kids eat better at the table and your family have more peaceful dinner times? Thanks for being here for the Healthy Parenting Connector. Yeah. So, so the first most important thing, and, 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 and the majority of us as parents don't even think about this, that we can do to help our children who are struggling with eating is get them in the correct seated position at meals. Mm-hmm. And, and, and here's the reason why. Because people think that in, in the body's list of priorities, eating is number one. Number one is not, uh, your, eating is not your number one priority. Breathing is your number one priority. Obviously, because if you can't breathe, you, you, you will not be alive. Makes perfect um, sense to me. So, so breathing is number one. And what I like to talk to families about is I want you to think about the last time you had a really bad head cold. How you eat a little bit and then you have to stop and breathe, right? And then you eat a little bit more, eat a little bit more. And after about three times of doing that, you're like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. I can't breathe. I can't smell. I can't taste. This isn't worth it. And that's actually what kids who have chronic congestion do. Kids who have environmental allergies, kids who have chronic sinus infections, kids who have asthma. And food allergies. Um, I know food allergies really absolutely affect, yeah. causes a lot of congestion. Absolutely. Food allergies, food sensitivities, mm-hmm. food intolerances. Um, those things are going to actually interfere with your breathing. Children who have respiratory disorders like cystic fibrosis, mm-hmm. uh, children who have cardiac issues, their blood isn't supplying enough oxygen out into the body because the cardiac system isn't pumping it like it should. Sure. So, so, so those kids are all going to struggle with eating because breathing is your number one priority. Oxygenation of the body is the, is the number one priority. Now, people think eating is your second priority. No, it's not. Protecting the brain and not falling on your head is your second priority. So what we in the therapy field call postural stability. And so you only have so much motor brain power available at any one time to do tasks. And if you are using up all your motor brain power to make sure you're posturally stable and not going to fall and hit your head, you're not going to have very much motor brain power left over to make your mouth work correctly, to make your hands work correctly. So this lack of postural stability not only interferes with eating, it also interferes with your children doing their homework correctly because we put them in child size desks, tables, chairs at school where they're seated in the right position. We bring them home and put them in adult chairs where they're not in the right position. So, so their, the, their body and their brain are sort of spending too much energy figuring out how to not fall off the chair, how to be exactly. comfortable. Exactly. And that's, that's why your incredible. kids sit on their knees. That's why they wiggle and squiggle. That's why they put one little butt cheek on the chair and one foot on the floor. And, and because the correct seated position for any, any of us, even as adults, is what we call a 90-90-90 position. Mm. 90 degrees at the hips, 90 degrees at the knees, 90 degrees at the ankles, which means your feet need to be flat on the floor. Mm. 
And we make children, most children sit for 20 to 40 minutes at a meal with no foot support. If you are not grounded, you are at risk for falling on your head. And wow. your body is going to spend all sorts of time to make sure you're not going to fall on your head and you're not going to be working your mouth. So the first most important thing parents can do is get their child in a 90-90-90 position. And so that means they're going to have to bring their child forward in the adult chair, give them a supportive backrest so the child's knees fall over the front edge of the chair because adult chairs are too long for children mm -hmm. from butt to knee. And then you're going to have to give them a foot rest in addition to that so they have a place for their feet because adult chairs are too long from knee to oh, yeah. ankle for children. I, I want your audience to think about the last time you went um, to a restaurant that had tall top tables or you maybe are out at a bar and it's a very tall bar and you get the bar stool that has no rung to it. How does that feel? What do you do as an adult? Well, first you start leaning forward, you lean backwards, so you true. turn around, you put one butt cheek on the chair, one foot on the floor, mm -hmm. and, and pretty soon you're standing up because you're like, this is, this is too much of a pain, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's what kids do as well. That's why kids want to stand and eat. That's why they want to walk around and eat is because if I'm standing... I can lock up my ankles, my knees, my hips, and have my upper body free to feed myself, and I'm not worrying about falling on my head. So, so you can make your own seating adjustments. Every three months, you're going to have to adjust all the pieces. Because your kids are growing. <laughs> oh, growing. No. And now from butt to knee and knee to ankle. So one of the things we actually recommend in our clinic, especially for problem feeders, is that parents consider purchasing the adjustable wooden chairs that are out there. Okay. And I've so, never, I cannot say I've ever seen these. Are they kind of a niche item? Um, not, it depends on where you're located. So okay. one is called the trip trap chair. T-R-I-P-P-T-R-A-P-P, -P -P, Trip Trap mm -hmm. Chair by a company by the name of Stokey. There's one that's called the Height Right Chair or the Kikaroo Chair um, by a company called Special Tomato. Um, there are other companies who make them, but you have to make sure if you're going to buy an adjustable wooden chair that it's fully adjustable, that the seat on the chair is adjustable up and down, forward and back, and the footrest is adjustable up and down, forward and back. Okay. Because the other thing about children sitting at adult tables is the correct height for your child at the table is for the table surface to hit halfway between the belly button and the breast nipples. Hmm. So we don't want your children's chin on the table, and we don't want the table on their lap. Right. The correct table surface is halfway between the belly button and the breast nipple. So the other thing you're going to have to do is put your child on some kind of hard cushion. Mm -hmm. So not like a pillow, but like a couch cushion. Why so, not a pillow? Because it's too squishy and wobbly and wiggly. Okay. You need something firm and solid. Like if you go to Joann's or a sewing store, mm -hmm. a hobby store, Michael's, they will have hard foam that mm -hmm. you would use if you were going to make couch cushions. That makes great seat elevators for your kids. It works well as the backrest for your child. But a step stool is going to work best as the footrest. Okay. It's just you're going to have to buy every three months all new pieces of it if you don't get an adjustable chair. Oh, so, my goodness. If your kids grow that fast, mine stay little. But um, just to clarify, is this just for picky eaters, problem feeders, or should no, every parent kids. be doing this? Okay. Every parent should be doing see, this. That's what's blowing me away because you don't see these chairs out at Lowe's and Home Depot. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to really search for them. You, if you look at them, I bet you Lowe's and Home Depot have them. You've probably Did seen you? them, but you've probably walked past them. Didn't know because what they were. Those people are focused on high chairs. Mm -hmm. And these adjustable wooden chairs actually can be used as high chairs. Okay. And we recommend that parents don't buy high chairs. Mm -hmm. um, because your child should be in a high chair only from about seven months to about 14 months. 
So many people spend an awful lot of money on high chairs when their children shouldn't be in them for very long. The yeah. adjustable wooden chairs can be used from the time your child is sitting up really well, up straight at, at meal, about seven months, mm -hmm. until about 10 years of age. Wow, so all of the parents with very young children are extremely fortunate to be hearing this conversation <laughs> at this point because they have the most to save in their budget. <laughs> it, is, it is one of the best things you can do for your kids is get them in the 90-90-90 position. And it is amazing that it's not better known. Wow. Uh, but but it par in part because people don't understand how complicated eating is. Absolutely um, not. No, now let's say, so I don't have that chair today. I'm going to feed my children in a few hours Yep. Is it better to have them with their feet curled under to just let them stand so they're not worried about falling to put them at like our child sized table, even if it's not a perfect I, fit? Yeah, it, 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 in some ways it would be better for them to sit at the child sized table mm -hmm. and for you to sit with them to have their okay. meal. The challenge with the child sized table is it's really easy to run away. <laughs> and <laughs> so it, it's a we prefer that you families to make the adjustments and have them up at the adult table because whatever adjusted chair you're going to put them in is going to be a little trickier for them to get away from um, and so they're more likely to stay in their chair as a result of that um, but today because you don't have those things purchased having them sit in the child size chair is good but mm -hmm. The second most important thing you can do as a parent to help your child eat better is to eat with them directly and be a good role model. And we know this from the research too. If you're in the kitchen with your child and you want them to eat a new food, but you're not sitting at the table, they will not eat the new food. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting at the table with them eating a different food than the new food you want them to eat, they also will not eat the new food. The only time kids eat new foods is when you, as the grown up, are sitting and eating the new foods. So if you want your child to eat more fruits and vegetables, you as a grown up need to cook more fruits and vegetables and eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, because being a good role model is the second most important thing you can do as a parent. Gotcha. That makes perfect sense. And at least, phew, at least I got that one right. Um, am I correct in saying that having your feet grounded, whether it's on a, a stool rest or a gr the actual ground, yep. is that the proprioceptive sense that you're kind of balancing yourself? Very good. I did, I did. Yeah. Well, we did an interview with, I think it's Melanie Pochak and her, the eight senses of feeding. So that's right. one we'll definitely link to from this yes. description. Yes. So fascinating. Yes, most definitely. And Melanie actually trained with us. Oh, um, and, and so um, that, that grounding is part of that proprioceptive sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the other option for you, if you don't want to put the kids cause, or, or you don't want to sit at the child size chair, because it's hard as a grown up to sit in those little baby yeah. chairs, is at a minimum, if the only thing that you can do is, is pull out one of your step stools from somewhere in the house and at least ground their feet. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the minimum thing that you could do. Okay. Most of us have two or three step stools, right? right? Somewhere in the house. Just pull one of them out and put a step stool under their feet. Uh, that's a good start if there's nothing else that you can do. Yeah, so interesting. But better, better seated than standing. Because some, yep. some of my kids do like, they get that one butt cheek on and then they're standing. Yep. And I say, you know, it's not a battle I'm going to fight. Right. But there, there are probably other problems with eating standing up. Right. Like your nervous right. system and stuff. Well, and if you're standing, you can run away easily. Mm. So again, it doesn't help the kids stay at the table. Gotcha. So the correct seated position not only helps them feel grounded, but it keeps them at the table. Um, and, and of course we need them to be at the table in order to eat, uh, yes. and stay at the table in order to eat enough. Right. Yeah. And we, I know it's a problem. That was when I started doing these presentations on adventurous eating, I would ask people like, what are you dealing with at the table? And the two that came up the most that just blew my mind because it's not been my experience was kids just literally running around, yep. leaving the table and the screens and the fact that they've fallen into a habit of using the devices yeah. as a crutch during feeding. And I thought, oh goodness, this is, yeah. <laughs> these are big deals. So, so one of the reasons why children leave the table is because they're not posturally grounded. Mm -hmm. The second most 
biggest reason why children leave the table is because they're not sure they can handle either the oral motor um, part of the food or they can't handle the sensation, sensory parts of the food. So and literally the fight or flight in their psychology. Exactly. They're like, I'm so, out of here. So what they do is leave. So the third most important thing we can do as a parent is structure our meal times. And, and we want to structure our meal times to help our kids get to the table and stay at the table and be adventurous seaters mm -hmm. and and so having a routine to meals is going to be the third most important thing we can do and unfortunately many of us don't have a routine to our meal mm -hmm. yeah. else. we tell our kids it's time to eat you pick them up out of their toys stick them in their chair and now they're crying because they weren't ready you know mm -hmm. we have to give our kids time to transition away from an activity so the beginning part of a meal should be a verbal warning we're gonna eat in five minutes. When the five minutes are up, I actually don't recommend that you say it's time to eat now because kids need a chance to transition from the play over here to the eating over here because eating is the hardest thing that they will ever do. And so what we want is to give them a transition activity. And the transition activity we prefer is hand washing because it gives them a chance to get used to the idea that I'm going to the table. It's a very nice hygiene habit to Absolutely. get them into, and it gets their hands ready to do this eating task. So when, it, when the five minutes are up, we say it's time to wash our hands now. Okay. And you have them go to the sink, crawl up on the step stool if they need to, and wash their hands. And then they can go to the table. So we're slowing down the process a little bit, giving their brain a chance to shift gears, and getting their hands ready. So we've already got a big chunk of preparation happening just simply by a verbal warning and hand washing. Yeah. When Sounds to me like setting the table and being involved in the food would also oh, help that transition. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. On the table, we want a placemat, and we want plain, boring placemats because I want the food to be more interesting than the placemat. Mm -hmm. But we like placemats for everybody, including the grown-ups, because a placemat defines your personal space. Hmm. And so it gives kids a visual cue of their personal space. On top of the placemat should be an empty plate. We need our families to go back to family style serving. Hmm. And, and family style serving is a key part of teaching your kids to learn to eat new foods. If you serve up their plate at the counter of the stove and there's a new food on it with their preferred food and you put that down in front of them, depending on their cognitive age, you may have just contaminated their preferred food with this asparagus and now I'm not eating anything at all. Plus, if you just hand me a plate that has asparagus on it and I don't like it or it's a new thing, you are going to send me into fight or flight, right? Wow. If you put it in front of me on a plate, I think I have to eat it as a kid. And if I'm not sure that I can eat it, I'm going to start getting stressed. When we stress our kids out at meals and put them into fight or flight, we've turned on their adrenaline. The problem with adrenaline at mealtimes is adrenaline turns off your appetite and it shuts down your digestive system both. So the more we stress our kids at meals, the more we're making the eating worse because we've turned off their appetite and they're not going to digest if they have eaten something because we've turned off the gut. Mm -hmm. so, so family style serving is, again, slowing the process down. So what I do as a parent is I want to start in the meal serving what my child's favorite food is first to set them up for success so we're not putting on the fight or flight. Mm -hmm. We're having noodles, spaghetti noodles. We're having spaghetti for dinner. I'm going to take some noodles, and you have plain noodles. I'm going to take some noodles and put them on my plate. Here, Joseph, you can have some noodles, put them on your plate, and then pass them to your sister. And we have some um, 
Parmesan cheese we can put on our noodles and then you pass that around and now we have spaghetti sauce we can put on our noodles and we have a little bowl of spaghetti sauce that we can use a small little mini fun baby ladle mm -hmm. and, and scoop it onto our our noodles what if Joseph doesn't like spaghetti sauce what if he he doesn't want to put any spaghetti sauce on his noodles what we tell him is that's okay if you're not ready for the spaghetti sauce to go on your noodles you could put some on your plate okay. um, if he doesn't want it on his plate we could say well let's get a little bowl and we'll put it on your placemat and you could put some spaghetti sauce on your placemat when he passes it to his sister even though even if he never eats that food what he has done is he's learned to tolerate it on his plate or in his personal space he interacted with it he's getting some smell and if it's a food you might serve with your fingers he might have even learned about how it felt so even if he didn't actually eat it he's learning about 15 of the steps on the steps to eating hierarchy wow just simply by doing family style serving that's amazing and yeah we i talk a lot about what i call the exposure bucket of just that the smells and the feels and the interaction yeah. with the food helps so yeah. i like the way you said it though train them that it's okay to eat or yeah and well and it's one of the reasons why we love kids to cook um, and it's one of the reasons why we love your program because we know that smell, the sight, the touching helps learn those early steps on the steps to eating hierarchy. But there is a cognitive component that comes into play when you're sitting at the table and the food comes onto your plate, right? Okay. And that cognitive component is now there's an expectation that I have to eat it. Mm. And so at the stove, at the counter, I don't have to eat that food so it's easier to learn about that food at the counter in the stove than mm -hmm. it is when it gets to the table unfortunately and the family style serving helps them take that process and slow it down so they'll learn so the the third part of the routine um, after everybody's done eating is to have a cleanup routine because many of us don't have an end to our meals. The kids mm -hmm. either have to stay at the table until his boring old grown-ups are done talking, and especially if I don't have time sense, I don't know when that is, so I think it's gonna be interminable torture. So of why course. come to the table in the first place if I have to just stay till those boring grown-ups are done talking? Or our kids take one bite and say, I'm done, and they run away. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a cleanup routine to the end of our meals, and we're the grown-ups, we're in charge of when cleanup is. Thank you for and, reminding us of that, and, yes. And so if your child tries to get down too early, you're gonna say, hey, we haven't done cleanup yet. You need to come back and finish your meal and we'll do cleanup. Mm -hmm. So obviously if your child's really overwhelmed, you don't want to, to make them wait an hour to do cleanup, right? right. <laughs> so, so, but the cleanup, routine is their job is to either at the table if you're okay with it have them clean off their plate into a compost bin or a scraps bowl or the trash or to bring their plate to the counter and to do that and that and that includes whatever got set on either a bowl or a separate plate or even directly on the placemat that has to be picked up and cleaned up too yeah so we're keeping the kids at the table by letting them move the food away from themselves if they're not ready for it versus themselves away from the food Excellent. and we're teaching them to stay at the table until this cleanup routine happens it takes about two weeks for human beings to learn new routines so the first two weeks will be you know a little bit chaotic right. but after two weeks when your child tries to get down and it's not cleanup time yet you can say you need to come back to the table we haven't done cleanup time and they will come back to the table now usually they're gonna sit down with a big sigh <sighs> and <Right>. eye rolling <laughs> but, but, but they're back at the table and and they can do their cleanup and and then 
that cleanup not only is really nice for you as a parent so that you're not doing all the dishes all by yourself. Exactly. But for young kids, they're socialized early. What goes in the trash stays in the trash, right? Mm -hmm. So if I get to put it in the trash, uh, yeah, I'll touch it with my hand. I might even put it in my mouth and blow it in the trash just because that's funny. And now I've either touched it or tasted it, tasted the food. And now we're up to like step 25 on the steps of okay. learning about this food. I so, love that this is such a win, win, win. We're having good feeding habits, good hygiene habits. Parents are sharing responsibility with the exactly. kids. Kids are learning to serve. We have routines. I mean, it's just, it's the whole, the whole package of how we want to raise successful adults. Now, let's say you're having something really tough for kids at a meal. And you're going to have something like liver and onions because it's got great iron in it, right? Sure. And you know your child's going to have a hard time having that liver and onions on their plate or even on, a, on their placemat. We would actually potentially introduce a concept we call the learning plate into mm -hmm. a meal. And the learning plate is a blank empty plate that sits in the middle of your table. And if there's a food your child really can't handle in their personal space, they are allowed to put it on the learning plate and then pass the food on. So even if it goes on the learning plate and doesn't get it eaten, they still got the vision steps, the interacts with steps, the smell steps. And then your job as the parent, because it is the learning plate, it is not the ignoring plate, is to do some teaching about the food that went on the learning plate. And then your child's job at the end of the meal is to clean off what went on the learning plate as well mm -hmm. as their own plate, their own placemat. So they're going to get one more learning experience, right, about that food. Okay. So, so, so I think about the other most important thing for parents to do to help their kids at mealtimes is to think about not being a dietitian, but instead think about being a teacher. Okay. When they're planning the meal, when they're cooking the meal, that's when they can think like a dietitian, right? About what is what is the nutrition content mm -hmm. of the meal I'm putting together. But once you get to the table, we need to have families think about being a teacher. If your child's a picky eater, it's because they're learning to only kind of sort of eat. Mm -hmm. So you need to teach them how to eat. That means you are the professor, mom and dad. Your child is the student. Food is your subject. And every meal is class. And coming to the table thinking like a teacher is going to make all of your mealtime experiences so much better for everybody involved. Because when you come to the table, it's about learning to eat, not about how much volume you eat. It's about learning to eat a wide variety of foods. It's about learning to be an adventurous eater and enjoying being an adventurous eater, right? Mm -hmm. That's what meals are about. It's about learning. It's not just about the volume that the okay. child eats. And, and what we want to think about is, is who are the best professors that you've had? Is the best professor you've had the one who says, sit down, be quiet, don't do it like this, do it like that, you're not doing it right, do it this way, no, the best mm -hmm. professor you've had is the one who gets in there, does it with you, has fun, makes it funny, makes it interesting, piques your curiosity. That's who a good teacher is, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we want parents to think about. They can be that dietitian up at the stove and the counter. Yeah. But when they come to the table, I tell parents, it's show and tell time. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about food groups. We're not going to talk about. You would because oh, you can't being a teacher, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's what a teacher would do. You would want to talk about the food. And most, of us, you know, and... most of us as parents during mealtimes, we never talk to our kids about the foods we're eating. Mm. We need to talk to them about the foods. That's why I say it's show and tell time. Okay. And your job as a teacher is to show your kids how to eat, be a good role model, and tell them about the food you're having. You, you better teach your subject, right? Right. 
So talk about the food groups. Talk about why you would eat liver and onions. Talk about what color it is. What size is it? What does it feel like in our mouth? Yes, absolutely want to do all of that stuff. Okay, that's so I, yes, I misunderstood. Would do. Yeah, yeah, I misunderstood thinking we don't want to talk about nutrition and macronutrients and all this kind of thing. Oh, no, that's level, a but, great thing to think okay. about. But we, what we don't want to do is force children to eat the right amounts. Right. So to Just me, when I think about being a dietitian, yes, some dietitians are really good professors and would teach about macronutrients mm -hmm. and micronutrients and vitamins and minerals. But when I, I think about most of us as parents being a dietitian, what most of us as parents think about when we are acting like dietitians is how much volume is my child eating? Are they getting enough protein? Have they gotten enough vitamin D, vitamin C? You know, we get into the minutia of how much of these things has my child consumed. Got it. That's not what, what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is teaching about nutrition. Perfect. Absolutely. So, I mean, I see this as, yes, being the teacher versus holding the clipboard and ticking, ticking yeah, off the boxes without analogy. actual interaction with the child's brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good analogy. Uh, instead of you standing back and being an observer, right, mm -hmm. of how much of X, Y, or Z did they eat, you got to get in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. you got to get in there and engage with them. And if you want them to eat foods that have higher nutritional value, you need to explain to your kids why those foods have more nutritional value, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and, and why would you choose this food over this food? Um, yeah, so yeah, sounds good. absolutely. I'm glad you clarified that because how I said it may have made other people think similarly. And, and I want to be clear that, that I want families to talk about that. Now, mm -hmm. I don't want them to just talk about the food. It would be great if they had a nice, normal conversation too about <laughs> their day, <laughs> you know, absolutely. <laughs> but we want parents to try to keep that to pleasant topics, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Because we don't want to initiate that fight or flight, that adrenaline exactly, and stress response. Exactly, because emotions are contagious, right? And kids have little emotional antennae. So if you're talking about the fact that your older child had to go to the principal today, mm -hmm. your younger child's going to get stressed by that, right? Because yeah. everybody's going to be unhappy. People may be fighting. That's going to send them into fight or flight. Their adrenaline's going to go up. Their appetite's going to go off. And because they're not hungry anymore, they're just going to start misbehaving, right? Sure. And, you know, when you were talking about how serving the food can initiate that sort of like visual sensory fight or flight when kids are nervous about new foods, I thought about the way sometimes I serve food, which is, come on, come on, guys, get to the table. We got to go. And I'm <laughs> maybe I'm go. people to see. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many how many times I think across the country are meals served in a very stressful way, either because we're under time pressure or because mom's just cranky raising yeah. mom's hand right now because it's yeah. the end of the day and I'm just done. Right. So I serve the food with anger instead of love. And I'm just sitting here like melting into a puddle thinking, yeah, like I'm literally hurting my kid's digestion when I do that. And that family style serving, especially when you give them permission, if they're not ready to eat it, mm -hmm. they can just leave it on their plate and learn about it. That's what you would say. Yep. It's okay. If you're not ready to eat it, we can at least learn about it. Mm, I love um, that. You know, and, and whether it goes on the plate or whether it goes on the placemat, the fact you're teaching them and giving them permission to move the food away from themselves onto the learning plate, for example, means they don't have to move themselves away from the food. Yep. And, and, and it's, it, gives, it, it slows the process down enough that it doesn't send them into that fight or flight. Like when you give them a whole plate of food and there's something like liver and onions on it, yep. <laughs> they're going to be like, ah! <laughs> sure, know? there's the implied expectation that I not only do I have to eat it, I have to eat it all. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, when we think about what can we do as parents to really help our kids, mm -hmm. get them in a posturally stable position, be a good role model, have a good routine to the meal times mm -hmm. is what we want to think about. And, and be a fun teacher. Be right. a fun 
teacher, uh, you know, and and because if you're not enjoying the meal, they're not going to enjoy it either. That is very uh, true. Now, I have a practical question. I'm kind yeah. of known for like distilling things into like, what's the practical thing that busy parents can do without going crazy? Yep. And so when I hear about family style eating and special ladles and bowls, I see my dishes doubling. Yes. And do. if I had a super picky eater, I would be happy to do that. But since I don't necessarily, does it, is it still a good idea? Like if the kids are at least serving themselves from the stove or the counter, like buffet style, or is that? Not yes, okay? that, that would be a way to do it as well. Right? <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> this, is, this is my job. Make it easier got, for families. You've got that exposure, yes. right? And they have a choice to approach the food or step back from the food. Okay. If you're doing a buffet, you get to make that choice. But part of going through a buffet style, uh, whether it's at home or actual buffet, mm -hmm. is you get exposed to those other foods, Perfect. right? The, the disadvantage of the buffet style is they only get the visual exposure. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's like you, too hot that, and they can't that, serve themselves, yeah. Well, well, right. But but let's say you're doing a buffet style and they you're doing taco night and mm -hmm. they skip over the avocado because they don't want to add that to their plate. What it, they only get visual learning about avocado. Whereas if you family style serve a plate of avocado and they're supposed to put a piece on their plate. It depends on if in, in your buffet, you would request that they put a piece on their plate or not. Right. Got it. So you would oh. definitely require every single item, even the toppings, to make at least oh. a drop on the plate. Somewhere on the plate. Yeah. That's fabulous. Okay. Yeah, that's that's good to know. how you would make it more equivalent to the family style serving. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about what's real, right? I've just given you what's ideal. We got to start with what's real. Amen. And, 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 and what's real for most of us is there's no way we're going to sit down and do family style serving at breakfast. We got to get people out the door. We got lunches we're trying to put together. You know, our Eight-year-old reminds us we're supposed to be doing school snack today, which we haven't prepared. I, I mean, breakfast is really challenging. So maybe all you can do is after school snack and dinner, mm. right? And as, as an adult, if you want your child to have a healthier after school snack, you should be sitting down and having a healthier after school snack with your child, right? Because if you're in the kitchen not eating that new food, they're not going to eat it, are they? So it's okay if you just sit down and have a bite or two of some carrots, right? Mm -hmm. But at least, and be a good role model. As long you know, as you're so involved, if, if families, yeah. yeah, if families can do, maybe for your family, you can only do the family style serving at dinner. That's okay. That still gives your child one opportunity to learn about new foods in a different way. Mm -hmm. oh. Sounds good. One of the phrases we use just to give parents, I mean, I like to give parents phrases because our brains are so full. Sometimes yep. we don't, we don't know what to say. We're thinking too much, right? Our brains are yep. done. And so one of the things we say is, would you like a serving or a taste? Okay. Like a taster or a serving. And then that allows the child to, you know, if they're too young to serve themselves, um, or if they've passed it over, you know, my, right. my bigger kids will not serve themselves. I'll say, oh, you missed the Brussels sprouts. Did you want a serving or a taste of that? Yep. And I, I, I like that phrasing that you use. Sometimes what families have is what they call a no thank you plate or a no thank you bite. The, the problem with labeling it as a no thank you plate or no thank you bite is to children, no thank you, if I've done it once, means I never have to do it ever again in my mm. lifetime. So having no thank you bites, no thank you plates actually close the cognitive doors. Okay. And, and so asking them, do you want a serving or a taste and not having a label associated with it is really key. Okay. It's really key. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like literally taking notes like, oh, take the no thank you bite out of the presentation. Because here, you know, it's my phrase, a serving or a taste, it's what we say. But in my presentation, I still say, yeah, yeah, make sure you do a no thank you bite. <laughs> no. Nope. No, no thank yous. Young children, no thank you means if I do it, I never have or have to do it again. Sure. It's an That's end. It yeah, is. it's an ending word. And it's a negative phrase. Right. right. First taste. They I hear a lot of first taste bites. You need to take a first taste bite. I like that one too. Uh huh. But what do you Better. do if your child really and truly can't take a bite? Well, I know what I tell people. 
<laughs> what, what did I tell? You about? <laughs> well, well, I I call it the salt approach. SLT. You can smell it, lick it, or taste it. Okay. And so the, at least the smelling is outside of like the the zone of your actual mouth. I think that's great. Whew, I think okay. if you're including smell as part of the taste, and all they can do is smell it, that's great. That's great. Right. Yeah, because you're not forcing them to do something that they can't mm -hmm. really and truly handle. And one of the problems when we make our children taste things and they have a really bad reaction to the taste mm -hmm. is what we've just taught them is that food is bad. Mm. And we've just given them what we would call in the field an aversive learning experience mm -hmm. about that food. Whereas if we slow it down and let them go at their own pace, they're going to be more likely to take a taste and be ready for it and manage it. Yeah. Um, and so the nice thing about having smell as part of your taste is smell is an introductory way to get a taste. Mm -hmm. Because we actually have scent receptors in the back of our throat. Yep. And so when you smell things, you're actually also tasting them. Right. And that's why when you go to the movie theater and you think, wow, I can almost taste the buttered popcorn. Actually, you are tasting the buttered popcorn. Mm -hmm. Without <laughs> it going to your hips. It's perfect. It, it, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so, yeah, I think that that's a great way to handle it. Yeah. And unfortunately, a forced bite is the opposite of this win-win-win. It's, it's a lose-lose right. because not only are you creating the power struggle, you're making a psychological issue between the parent and the child, but you're, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot on that food being accepted ever, it sounds right. like. Right. And, and, and because you have sent up their adrenaline, turned off their appetite, and their GI system on top of it. Right. Whatever they do eat is not being digested, so you might right. as well just throw it away. Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so hard as parents because we want so badly for our children to eat healthy and grow well. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's hard to not let that really good desire that we have as parents set us up to do something that's not helpful for our kids, right? Yeah, um, and, and that's perfect. Yeah. The last question I always ask is just, I mean, especially sometimes we feel overwhelmed with so much information and we feel like there's this standard we have to reach. So like if you just talk to parents' hearts, what do you want us to remember most of all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for real. Start it real. Mm. <laughs> we know there's ideal up here, but we got to start with what's real and, and work your way to ideal one teeny tiny step at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the one thing from today you think you can do easily and do that one thing and, and then tuck the other ones in the back of your head and pull them out when you're ready to do those. <laughs> So. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Toomey. I, I've already made a well. note that this will be two or three. I think this will be two or three uh, segments so that people can kind of digest that. Okay. No pun intended. A little, <laughs> a little better, um, but such <laughs> fabulous information. I, I just really appreciate it. And I'm honored to share, you know, your worksheet with our, our students, our families here. And I'm really honored to be I part of it. your program because I, I know that you're helping kids in such fabulous ways. So thank you for being here. Uh, and obviously, thank you for the work that you do because we find that it really helps our kids as well. Wonderful. Well, we are a good team and audience. Yeah. We've got more where this came from. So definitely come back here next week for another edition of the Healthy Parenting Connector. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>